Welcome to Conversation Starters at the Menard Family Initiative. Today's topic is telehealth with Chelsea Ale and John Souders from the Mayo Clinic Health System. Now here's our host, Adam Hoffer. Dr. Ale, Dr. Souders, thank you for joining me. You recently wrote an article for the MFI briefs regarding your shift to internet-delivered psychotherapy. You had to quickly shift from doing in-person, face-to-face patient visits to meeting via Zoom. Now, when I first read this, I thought, that doesn't sound so hard. But when I read your article, you said that you started by asking your employees and staff, can you access your email from home? And the answers weren't all yes. So can you walk us through this transition of face-to-face interaction with patients to uh, meeting virtually? Yeah, it was quite the the journey. Um, it was kind of fun to to step ourselves back through as we as we wrote the article. And actually, John and I came together just saying, "What all did just happen here?" Because <laughs> it was a fast and furious couple weeks when we got the word that we would need to be shifting folks home, and that we would really be trying not to bring people into the clinic. Um, and we quickly surveyed our staff to find out that most did not have access to email at home, most did not have um, access to laptops at home. And so that presented a lot of really challenging barriers to getting this up that weren't necessarily what you would think of when we wanted to be focusing on, all right, what are the actual clinical skills that might be different? What what are the competency needs that are, are different perhaps for delivering psychotherapy over the internet Um, we ended up really having to focus on some of those technical pieces. And John can kind of speak to to how we overcame those a little bit. Yeah, it's an interesting concept because we've been doing um, clinic-to-clinic video appointments for uh, 10-plus years. And so the digital platform really wasn't new for us. But uh, meeting with patients via video in their homes was a completely uh, brand-new world for us. And... Having to do that from home to home complicated it even more because we needed to ensure patient privacy, confidentiality, uh, technology, uh, resources that are there on both ends, so with our provider and our patients. Uh, So it was a very complex process because we have a large department, and so we're going down to uh, connectivity for Internet, laptops, webcams, microphones, all during an epidemic when everyone is trying to get those resources. And so the resources were scarce. Uh, It was just, it was a difficult and complex kind of logarithm to uh, identify everything we need, shift 35 plus providers home uh, to meet with 700 plus patients on a given week. Uh, So pretty complex process to flip uh, our entire uh, practice from face to face uh, to video appointments that prior week, uh, the previous week. You know, I hadn't really thought through what that process would entail until you just mentioned some of these things uh, in in terms of having patients at their homes. Did did you find that that this was a challenge too? I mean, I have a I I have a young one at home, and it it it, it's hard for me to fathom uh, taking you know meetings into my house, (laughs) let alone trying to do something as complex as. Uh, meet with a, a doctor or <laughs> some of these some of these things that you know we're all sort of accustomed to being able to carve out a 30 minutes or an hour of, of private time. Did, did your patients have trouble with this as well? Some did, yeah. Some it was really difficult for us to figure out what is a private space that they can um, feel free to speak freely, right? Especially for something as, as personal and private as psychotherapy. Um, We needed to make sure that our patients felt safe in their spaces to be able to talk about some of the issues they were tackling. Uh, I can remember one uh, anecdote was a patient, a college student, who lived among roommates. And so, you know, she didn't have a car. We ended up having to problem solve that she would go and sit in her her roommate's car um, so that that was a a private and secure place that she couldn't be overheard um, in therapy. Uh, So those were some of the just kind of boots on the ground as you go. All right, what are some what are some of the resources you have? How can we problem solve this? Yeah. Uh, I know working with children, I looked at many pets 
and many um, butts of cats as, <laughs> as we were up close and personal in the home. Um, you know, you give a, an eight-year-old a phone, even when they're talking in a, an important meeting or you don't expect, to, how are you doing this with children, right? They're showing me their houses. They're showing me their newest Lego creations. And it actually was a neat way that we could get a little more intimate with our patients um, to be able to actually see their home environment and some of the things that, that are important to them as well. So I think there were important benefits that we hadn't even anticipated. And I'll just speak to you. I think equally, equally as challenging was for our providers to transition a professional practice into that same scenario for themselves in their own homes. And so they were dealing with the, their own interruptions in their own home. Uh, and so it really did shift... Um, you know, uh, this perspective of a controlled environment in a clinic setting uh, where you have sound machines to eliminate, eliminate noise, you have, you know, comfortable furniture and things that you're disposable in an office. Uh, and our providers were forced to adapt to this really quickly uh, in their own home environments. And so uh, I think it was just as equally as complex to deliver care um, and high quality care in that kind of environment uh, as the patients were adapting to this as well. Um, but I just kept coming back to this message of uh, giving our providers and our patients grace during this process because um, asking you know, our professionals, our providers to work from home was just really unfair because it was, a, you know, it was, this was forced on everyone and a needed solution to ensure safety in our communities. But it wasn't going to be perfect. And so we had to give our providers and our patients some, uh, some grace to know that you're going to see animals, you're going to see kids, you know, and these things <laughs> are going to interrupt, you know, normal treatment. And, and that just flexibility of saying, you understand, I think was really important for people to hear. Yeah, uh, I mean, so, so much of that, I, I feel like every question you answer opens a, or just creates another five questions for me. And I'm, I, I, I can only imagine that, <laughs> that you have to be dealing with the same sorts of things. I, for me, it seems, seems absolutely fascinating that you can take this challenge, which, which at first seems, uh, I mean, what a, a really difficult task to achieve, getting access for all of your employees, access to all of the patients, but then you can turn it into something that uh, is perhaps a, a wonderful opportunity, right? And, and I, I, I love that example of uh, all of a sudden with, with, a, with, with a, a young child, for example, you can, you can see in their room, right? And, and you can see the things that are important to them. I, I hadn't pictured that, but I'm, I'm picturing, right, Lego towers and, and uh, you know, superhero posters on the wall that, that really let you... Uh, get to know your patients in a way that you might not be able to if they're just traveling into the office. And, and uh, I, I think we all know that it, it's, it, it's hard to uh, be able to spend as much time with, with your patients as you would love to be able to spend with them. But really, like this, this seems like a wonderful opportunity. So on that line, I mean, what, what do you think the future of telemedicine looks like for you here in La Crosse? Uh, is it, is it, has it been something that is has opened more doors that you'd like to continue doing and expand, or is this, uh, is this something that might go away in a year or two? Yeah, I can I just speak to, oh, I'll, I'll do a tiny bit, John, and then if you want to add on sort of to where we're at now and where we're going. Yeah. Um, uh, so even though we ended up in this situation with unforeseen circumstances, this was all part of our, our plan growing forward to um, 2030. So we had really been setting forward um, the steps that were required to start doing this. This opens up huge opportunities for a lot of our rural patients um, to not have to travel to clinics um, and really moves towards what Mayo Clinic is trying to do in terms of innovating the ways that we can deliver care and who we can deliver care to and in which different ways. So this really just fast forwarded things, which was the technological challenge and um, really had us having to think outside the box. How do we do what we were planning on doing in 10 years? How do we do that in a week span? Um, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And I think this was a really great um, example of really how you can motivate in, in a crisis. 
Um, but as we think about right now and where we move forward, uh, I think a lot of the barriers stand at a national level in terms of reimbursement and in terms of um, uh, licensing requirements, state to state and um, over televideo. Yeah, I think so. What this what this is going to do for the entire healthcare field um, is um, really launch different types of treatment, um, specialties, follow up care um, for patients to receive that anywhere. Um, and I, I, that was the model of healthcare um, that was already kind of in place and was is projected to come over the next several years. Uh, this really just fast tracked. Um, what we were doing, what we were able to do, um, you know, and I often think about, you know, Mayo Clinic as a, as a cruise ship. It's a, it's a big organization and it can be really hard to turn quickly. You know, you think about a, a speedboat, like needing to be a speedboat in a crisis uh, situation or a pandemic and Mayo Clinic as a large organization became a speedboat and turned and flipped to the entire uh, way we deliver care uh, to virtual, and and I think that's the model that we're we're going to be heading towards uh, in healthcare. Um, so currently, you know, in our, in our region, this is not just for behavioral health, but um, every uh, department and specialty is being asked to consider what different types of patient appointments can be made virtual, uh, and it's going towards this kind of theme of care anywhere. And so it's really breaking down barriers and access to treatment and allowing patients to access treatment from wherever they are and wherever our pro providers are. And I've kind of already started thinking through, um, you know, my first year back uh, in Wisconsin, after several years away, we had three big snowstorms and it shut our clinics down for, you know, a couple of days at a time. And so... People who needed this life-changing care didn't have access to it because roads were closed, businesses were closed, uh, and what a model of care that we have now that if that were to happen again this coming winter, um, our providers are able to stay home, patients can stay home, we have the safety factor in place for our community members, and they're still able to receive their care at the same time they were going to. Uh, so it's a phenomenal way. Uh, to reach our patients uh, and just remove some of the barriers that we have from time to time uh, and allow us to meet with our patients anywhere they're out. I mean, that's, that, that's fascinating. And I, I think it's one of the, one of the stories that I, I think should really come out of the, the pandemic here are that, you know, we, we can find innovative solutions, right? And the, the solutions don't have to only address the problem now, but hopefully once we solve this problem, then in the future, look at what we have available to us. The, you know, I, I, I was thinking of you know, telemedicine in the state of Wisconsin, and we have a lot of parts of the state that are very, very rural, right? I mean, I, I think in the city of La Crosse, we are blessed with the amount of health care we have per person, uh, the number of beds, the number of doctors, right? But as soon as you leave the city, it... it it seems that, um, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you uh, where the, the next closest large facility would be, you know, traveling north, east, south, and west, right? And so I, I, I see this as a, uh, it seems like it could be a, a phenomenal opportunity to really help those that would otherwise have trouble getting to La Crosse and, to see a, a physician. Do, do you think that it would also, I, I you know, help your providers as well in, in terms of being able to uh, potentially, you know, I, I, imagine we, you, I imagine that somewhere in the office you have uh, folks that don't live in the city of La Crosse, right? And so now if, if, if there's a snowstorm like you, like you mentioned, Dr. Souders, that uh, all of a sudden if a, if a physician can't get in, it, they have to cancel all their patients for a day. But now if we have uh, access to this kind of technology, we might be able to work around that. It, it, is that the kind of thing you envision for uh, your staff and employees as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, and when you even step out a bit further, when you go to recruitment um, for hiring, you know, top quality um, professionals, uh, there's there are people that are some of the best in their field, but they don't want to live in Wisconsin or Minnesota. <laughs> and so, how do you hire? 
and recruit these folks that maybe are living in more desirable climates. You know, if you think about Florida, Hawaii, you know, some of those southern states that, you know, have nice weather year round, uh, maybe they don't want to leave that location. And so we're able to recruit and hire folks from across the country to provide digital care to our patients in Wisconsin. Uh, and this is some of the work that you'll continue to see expand, I think, in our field, but in, in the medical field uh, overall. And I think it goes back to some of Dr. Yale's comments around licensing, reimbursements, insurance coming along and up to speed um, with matching that model of care. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was just thinking the so uh, you can, you can it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the Mayo Clinic has... Uh, branches in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Florida. Is it those those four states? Now, I I see this as a like man, what another tremendous opportunity to potentially long run right be able to provide in network care for a physician who lives in Florida to a patient in Wisconsin. That 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 sounds fascinating. Well, I think it just elevates the level of care we're able to provide, right? Because that makes everyone not have to be a jack of all trades in each region, but you can really specialize. And as you have a specific set of problems, you know, we treat that in Florida. Okay, well, that doesn't mean you have to go to Florida. <laughs> that means that we'll, we'll pull in that professional. The Mayo Clinic itself has an amazing network, and we can always reach out to other professionals within this network, but to be able to offer those professionals really easily to our patients, I think would take us really to the next level of being able to uh, change the care we provide in, in our specializations, but then also just provide an extremely high level of care to our patients across the board. I, I think each of you have mentioned at, at least once that there may be some barriers to using this kind of technology moving forward. So, I mean, in, in terms of uh, what, what barrier, I guess, what barriers do you see to expanding telemedicine or virtual care to patients moving forward? I, I, I heard that there was some, there are, of course, Lots of questions to be answered in terms of insurance, in terms of uh, billing and care, and, and and how do you code this, and and what do all these things mean? Can can you walk us through some of the the challenges that you see to providing telemedicine and, and virtual care to patients in the future? Yeah, as a, a relatively new cutting edge part of our field. It really, it hasn't been um, well reimbursed thus far. And so when the pandemic hit and really the whole nation made this quick shift, um, the CARES Act and uh, even in Wisconsin Department of Health and Human Services really lifted a lot of those regulations um, to, to really open the floodgates um, for folks to be able to, to receive virtual care. So I actually, have, I remember being on in session with a few of my patients and talking about kind of what is our, our plan for the next couple of months um, and will we be able to continue to meet virtually or do we need to shift it back to face to face um, and patients saying, well, it's not virtual care is not typically reimbursed for us or covered by our insurance. But until this CARES Act, you know, hangs in or wears out, whichever way you want to look at it, um, we can continue to do it over over the Internet like this. Um, so, so much of our field is really dictated by what our patients have um, insurance support for. Um, so, I think that's going to really dictate uh, the way that our market can allow us to um, continue to provide these services, depending on um, what there's advocacy for and support for uh, post-pandemic or in this in-between time. And I would further say that, you know, the more I travel Wisconsin, the more I realize how remote a lot of people live. Um, and with that comes broadband issues, internet issues, um, and folks that just don't have access um, with um, internet, you know, poor internet speeds or a lack of internet providers overall. Um, they don't have that uh, to be able to use technology to access these kind of services. Um, you know, Mayo Clinic has already done uh, significant work um, across the state to try and address some of those issues. But, you know, when we think about care anywhere for anyone, 
that's going to be a, um, a big question that needs to be answered and resourced so that um, someone that lives in rural Wisconsin has the same access to treatment as someone who lives in La Crosse. And so when we think about equity and access for patients, um, for me, that, that becomes the biggest thing. Um, you know, during COVID-19, uh, the first uh, few weeks of that, what we were doing is we were non-billing a lot of our services just to ensure that our patients were still able to meet with us, receive care. Um, but that's not a sustainable model of care uh, for most people. And so, you know, I'm confident that the, the reimbursement, the insurance companies will will come behind this and there'll be a lot of good learnings for us moving forward. But I think that the big question is, is how do we get uh, connectivity to all of our uh, regional and remote areas in Wisconsin, but also the country to make sure people have the proper access they need to access care. Yeah, the, the, those are certainly some uh, potentially large challenges uh, but I, I, for one, I, I would be optimistic on, on some of the, the technological issues. Uh, I, I think so. Uh, coming back to those, that seems really interesting in terms of, you know, having the rural community be able to connect and whether that's uh, virtually via you know, Internet. And I, I have to admit that I have you know, very little idea what uh, rural Internet access looks like in our state. But I, I certainly can, ima can imagine that. Uh, there are some challenges here. And then uh, back to what Dr. Ale mentioned, I insurance coverage. Uh, this is a, seems like another really big black box that uh, <laughs> can, seems to have a lot of challenges because not only are you dealing with right, a, several different private insurance providers, but uh, I imagine that a, a, a large uh, section of, of your patients are on federal insurance or uh, state insurance, you know, Medicare, Medicaid. And so... Uh, this the, this kind of insurance changes would would require coordination, perhaps at the federal level, the state level, and then also in the private sector as well. <laughs> right, we'll transition to the last part of the show. This is the part we call the four forward. They're the same four questions that we ask all of the guests on our show. So the first question is, what is one reading you would recommend and why? So I'll go first, and I'll preface this with, um, when I read, I like to read uh, useful and practical things. Um, I'm not a, a fictional uh, type of person, and so um, uh, I tend to also probably stick to reading closest to my professional field uh, in this realm. And so uh, I think that probably the book that I love the most that I can just pick up and read and find value in, uh, in my personal life and professional life is a book called, uh, hold me tight by, uh, Sue Johnson. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a personal take on some of her evidence-based practices from, uh, an emotionally focused, uh, therapy approach for, for marriages. Uh, but it just makes things so practical, uh, uh relatable for people, um, full of just touching stories that I think people, uh, can take something away from. And so uh, those are the kind of books that I tend to lean towards. Hold Me Tight's definitely a good uh, marital book on uh, increasing intimacy and emotional connection with your, with your spouse. Did, did you say the author was Sue Johnson? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you. Dr. L, do you want to add your own? You, you guys can take turns. You can each answer or uh, you can go back and forth, either or. <laughs> That's fine. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this, I I like to also read things that are real human interest stories um, and thinking about, you know, what would I want someone to, to read as a recommendation? I would recommend reading uh, The Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Occurred to me. I read it last summer. I believe it's a memoir in the memoir genre um, that really goes through um, a good example of the intergenerational transmission of uh, social status of mental health problems and really even ties into the opioid epidemic and um, substance abuse. And, I, you know, I, I think we often um, as a community put a lot of blame on an individual, but this book really looks at how, um, how different generations really can feed into that um, setting and that those problems and um, can really take a different look at um, what, what an individual can achieve and the, the pieces that go into those struggles. So, 
Hillbilly Elegy. I, I also read that book and I, I, I found it fascinating. And I, I, I think that's a, a, that's a great suggestion. Uh, uh, probably a book that I should, I should reread myself. <laughs> so thanks for that recommendation. Uh, second question, what innovation are you most looking forward to? Uh, I would just say something that I'm, uh, I have continued interest in is just the digital platform for mental health services. Um, it's uh, um, certainly in its early stages for, for a lot of people um, and a lot of practices. Um, and, and I'm most excited, I think, when you think about the work we were able to do in one week, two months, the last four months around digital platform and connecting with our patients in a completely different way, um, it just excites me to think that that's a piece of our practice, that's a piece of healthcare uh, that we're growing and we're moving towards rapidly. Because um, again, I think the heart of what we're trying to do here is connect high quality providers and patient care with our patients. And so, you know, moving, removing any of those barriers and being able to meet with anyone who needs that care uh, really touches at the core of what Mayo Clinic is about. And so, uh, innovating that service line, um, that new approach to what we do every day uh, really excites me. And it's actually something that I look forward uh, to each day when I go to work is how to continue to move that practice forward. Uh, so that, that is right on the forefront of, I think, what's most exciting for me right now. I, I also look forward to uh, the advantages on the di digital platforms, uh, both in, in the sense for... Uh, that it enables greater connectivity and uh, I'm constantly fascinating at, at what digital platforms are, are able to do. Uh, they're constantly pushing the bounds of, of how they're able to facilitate us to learn and connect and uh, that, that, that enters uh, the realm in, in which I work as well. I think these digital platforms are, are fascinating. Mm -hmm. A piece that I want to add there is also that we can stay in touch between sessions a lot mm -hmm. better and keep patients working, making progress by just answering one question that takes me 30 seconds to reply to. But even if it's a phone call, right, then I'm interrupting my day, I'm returning a phone call, I'm leaving a message, I'm returning a phone call again, really just being able to shoot messages back and forth almost in real time with my patients just to really fix some of those hiccups that would have stalled progress throughout the week. Um, is just another way that we're not even talking about telemedicine necessarily or, or virtual visits, but just answering a little question. Um, that portal and that broad digital platform, I think, is really going to transform the way that we deliver and receive care. It'll be interesting, too, to when you think about this, just what do we do with all the buildings that no one's working in, in 10 years? <laughs> you know, do we turn those into parks? Do they become, you know... Uh, amusement uh, museums. I mean, uh, we're going to have this work from anywhere, receive care from anywhere. And I'm like, what do we do with our universities, our hospitals? Uh, there's certainly a place for some service lines and some things that are in person. But I mean, you think about the innovation of the digital platform and even you think about grocery shopping and how you can order all your things online and they show up at your front door. Um, you know, like in 10 years, what, it, what does the infrastructure in our cities look like? Uh, and what do we do with all that extra space is another kind of fascinating thing to think about. The whole state becomes <laughs> no. yes. more water parks. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we're, 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 we're jumping into an area of conversation that I, 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 I think I could sit here and, and talk for another hour about. I, <laughs> I, I, I love talking about sort of what, what this future could look like, you know, the, the future of just commercial space, generally speaking, is fascinating. Uh, I mean, everything from mall closures to, like you said, now now we're starting to see uh, people working from home. We're starting to see right uh, education from home, uh, visiting patients from home. And so what, what happens to all this commercial space and uh, sort of the, the, the entrepreneur in me and, and the uh, optimistic entrepreneur slash economist sees this as uh, another real opportunity, right? I mean, uh, there are there are loads of, of other challenges that we have at, at the society level that uh, this could this could push a long way forward. I mean, imagine a imagine a, a large nonprofit organization 
Uh, you know, we have several here in lacrosse, other other people that, that wrote articles for, for the briefs that could turn this into housing, low-income housing, right? Well, we have lots of other challenges that, uh, you know, you close one door and, and it opens an opportunity somewhere else. And so uh, I, I, for one, I mean, I, I, I see it as a challenge, but an exciting challenge <laughs> that, um, right, all of a sudden, you know, we thought we created a problem, but we ended up creating three solutions instead. Uh, and so that, that, that's the kind of stuff that gets me going. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to see where that goes. So on that, tell me, what are you working on uh, professionally or, or personally? What, what, uh, what, what are you working on? Uh, what, what next innovation could we see coming from you? I think similarly in, in speaking to how we deliver care, we're really looking on getting our department out of just our department and infiltrating the rest of the practice. So we're really looking on infiltrating the rest of the practice with behavioral health. Um, and I'd say that that's the, the, our next step um, is how can we really get upstream in primary care offices so that when you come in and you're saying, gosh, I've been having a ton of trouble sleeping. Well, we have a, a therapist who can talk to you about some sleep recommendations and some ways that you can um, relax before you go to bed or ways that you can shift your sleep schedule. Um, so it doesn't have to escalate to the point of having a major mental health problem, but we can catch those pieces early, do some tweaks right within your medical home and um, really avert major mental health crises. Um, and on the other end of things, really integrating into our specialty care as well. Um, so when you go and you see your oncologist for treatment, you're also receiving support and mental health support right there um, by someone who's trained in psycho-oncology. There's a lot of specific trainings um, within psychiatry and psychology that aren't even utilized in, in communities like ours. Um, that's a real term, psycho-oncology, um, but it's probably not something that is known um, out in the world. So really utilizing our field at the highest level of our ability to really give those services. Yes, there will still be services that are needed for mental health problems um, and expanding our services to be right then there where you need us within the broader practice um, where your doctors are. This, this may sound like a little bit of plug for our department, um, <laughs> but we are... Uh, actively working on um, growing our addiction psychiatry and therapy treatment at Mayo uh, here in Southwest Wisconsin. And we just hired uh, an addiction psychiatrist uh, who finished their residence, residency and fellowship at Yale. Uh, you know, one of the best psychiatrists I think we've hired in this region. And, um, you know, when we think about an epidemic like COVID-19, um, and the impacts that has had on mental health, on addiction, um, on different people in this community who are struggling. Uh, it's put a vulnerable population in another, you know, vulnerable uh, place. And uh, we've seen uh, relapses rise. We've seen um, our patients who struggle with addictions really uh, struggle during this time period from the lack of resources uh, available and around them. Um, and so we're, we're actively... Uh, growing and trying to meet the needs of this population, um, but growing our addiction program here uh, at Mayo Clinic in Southwest Wisconsin is, is a really big project for us and something we're actively doing. Uh, and there's a ton of excitement about it um, and a lot of support from our, our regional leadership on that. Wow, those are some <laughs> those are some really high level. Uh, innovations. I, I certainly wish you the best of luck, and I, I can't wait to see what you're you're able to accomplish <laughs> on those on those big goals. That certainly seemed fascinating, uh, and I, again, I'm, I'm I'm excited to see what you're what you're able to do with this. And last question: What should we be discussing more? What, what would you like to see us be discussing more uh, at a societal level on a college campus? What should we be talking about more? I'd love to hear folks, especially on college campuses and in higher education, talking more about a shortage of high qualified healthcare workers, um, especially for mental health. You know, a big controversial topic in the news these days is defunding the police. 
um, and how we should really be shifting the focus to have mental health workers intervening in many of these crisis situations. Um, but it's not talked about the fact that we actually already have a shortage of high qualified um, social workers, clinical social workers, psychiatrists, child psychiatrists, all of these folks who, yes, we would love to have them actually intervening in real crises out in the community could make a huge shift in our whole society. Um, that's going to require a lot of additional training and um, really starting from college campuses, more investment in our, our young folks these days um, to be excited to get involved in those fields so that we can hire them and we can um, get folks the, the services that they need where they need them. Sure. I mean, the, I mean, you mentioned social work, psychologists, psychiatrists, you're, we're, we're talking about four year degrees, eight year degrees, 10 year degrees. I mean, these are, I, 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 I can't imagine that we're, we're, we're swimming with, with an, uh, with a really deep pool full of uh, extra social workers or psychologists or psychiatrists uh, to help, to help with these issues. And so I, I think that's a real, it's a real important issue to discuss. Uh, and I, 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 uh, I would be curious to see how we can uh, sort of what, what the first steps would be to start encouraging, I guess, more of those kinds of degrees and, and people that, that fit into those areas. I, I, I'm not entirely sure what the first step would be, but uh, I work on a college campus, so uh, I, can, I, I can ask our, our, our provost is a, is a former psychology professor, uh, and so I'm, I'm sure she might have a few comments on the matter. <laughs> So I would say, you know, I'm going to throw this out there, and yeah, I struggled during an epidemic where we're talking about, um, you know, healthcare. We're talking about the health of individuals. Um, I, I don't know how we're not talking about childhood sexual abuse and trafficking more in our um, larger conversations as a community, as a society, uh, as a nation and country. Uh, it's one of the biggest epidemics, the, the fastest growing uh, health concerns for uh, our children. Um, that, that needs to be talked about more. Uh, these, are, these are kids and children who don't have a voice for themselves, don't have the platform, the resources, um, or, the, or the, um, you know, the ability to step outside of those situations uh, and those scenarios. Uh, and the stats are, are staggering around how many children um, are affected by this. Um, and so when I, when I sit in an epidemic and we talk about some really serious things in our community and we're not talking about childhood sexual abuse and trafficking of these kids uh, as a larger growing epidemic and one that has the impact on generations to come uh, for a very long time. Uh, that bothers me on my personal uh, core a lot. And the professional side is um, we're working with these kiddos uh, day in and day out. And, and we see the effects of this uh, in, the, in their own lives and their families' lives. And uh, it's really something that I think is uncomfortable for people to talk about, uh, to acknowledge, and really even know how to help. Um, and so there's, um, you know, there's a great resource out there, Darkness to Light, uh, has a lot of free education, uh, a lot of free resources just for general community members to uh, help educate themselves, understand how they can get involved in acknowledging um, that this is going on, uh, giving the skills and resources they need to be able to identify it, who do you talk to about that. Um, but it's a great resource, and uh, this is just something that I think needs to be talked about more on every level. Because um, these children are, you know, they're our next healthcare workers, they're our next professors, they're the next, um, you know, bankers, really, you, you name it. They're their up and coming generation, and for this growing epidemic to not be discussed uh, and resources and advocacy poured into that, uh, I think is a concern for, for our country. Tell me, where do you where do you think the first uh, big steps are in terms of addressing this? Do you think it's making attempts to destigmatize uh, this from existing people who have dealt with this and have since grown up? 
Do you think it's a, a community effort to identify and report where is possible? What, where do you think the, the, the first steps are that we can, I mean, as, as individuals and, you know, potentially as groups or, or as a, a movement, what, where can we go in trying to improve on this? What are the first steps or, or the next steps? Mm -hmm. I love the idea of really just destigmatizing it. Um, there's a lot of shame around it, maybe, mm -hmm. obviously, maybe not, um, of folks who are survivors of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, just because it happened to you, really understanding that's not your fault, um, that's something that you had probably very little control over. And um, there are things that certainly as an adult you can do to inform other people about it and to um, get the word out. You know, I think that we've done, made a lot of progress in terms of schools becoming um, a lot more informed about trauma. Um, so really trying to recognize early warning signs that somebody might be having some behavior changes or, you know, a child might be acting out, not just thinking, oh, that is a bad kid or, um, you know, punishing the child, but really looking further into it. What might be going on at home? What might, what sort of questions could you ask to find out what other supports are needed there um, in order to help just start a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it really only takes uh, one other strong adult uh, in a child's life to really buoy that resilience. Um, so, you know, anyone can be that, a teacher, a, a person at church, um, another person in that child's life who can ask, hey, are you okay? <laughs> can make all that difference. Um, so I think on a community level, any of us can be that. Um, really getting to know other kids, um, being um, that person who can just be another strong figure or someone that a child knows they can reach out to if they need to, um, can be another important step that any of us can take. Mm -hmm. And I would just further say that I think um, having readily available skills in parenting for just um, anybody, college courses, high school courses on safe boundaries for children. Uh, you know, I think there, there's a lot, uh, the majority of these cases happen with uh, child sexual abuse happens uh, in the family or someone that's connected to the family uh, fairly close. And so how do you, how do you as a parent or even as a community educate younger parents on how to protect their children um, in a way that doesn't feel too restrictive and like you're just safeguarding everything about your child, but how do you recognize the appropriate boundaries uh, for where your children are going, who they're hanging around with, uh, are doors closed, you know, I mean, do things feel, you know, different and just having that lens as a parent is so important uh, to protect your, your, ch your child, um, but there has to be that acknowledgement like that this exists in our community. Uh, and it's a pretty widespread uh, problem. But then how do we also help parents in our community to have those skills just to be able to recognize an unsafe situation um, and to protect our kids, I think, is another thing that our community can do better at. Well, I, I certainly uh, hope that we can make progress on, on both of the things that we, we need to talk more about. I, I completely agree that these are really big picture issues. And that's, that, that's one of the reasons that I, I wanted to start a show like this, because uh, th this will give us a, a platform and an opportunity to talk about the challenges we face, right? We, we know that we can, each of us as individuals can keep getting better, but then as a society, as a community, we can, uh, work to get better and, and certainly uh, help those that are in more need and, and more vulnerable than ourselves. So uh, Dr. Ale, Dr. Souders, thank you again for coming on. I, I really appreciate your time and, and thanks for joining us. We've loved thank being you. here and having the opportunity to talk more about the impact that we can all make on our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the time.